If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this super exciting episode of it's Mind so Pump. so exciting, mm. Sal. Look, uh, for the first 45 minutes, uh, we don't talk a lot about fitness, but we do have our fun introductory conversation. My we start favorite out part of the conversation. By talking about Valentine's Day, what that's all about for us. And uh, Justin's Butcher Box Valentine's Day barbecue. He's given his wife a steak yeah. for Valentine's Day. It's a great gift. Yeah, there uh, you go, honey. I also talked about the liver meatballs I like to make with the Butcher Box grass-fed ground be- ground beef. Um, and I throw a little chicken liver in that so my kids get to eat those organ meats. You uh, sneaky son of a bitch. We are sponsored by Butcher Box. If you go to butcherbox.com forward slash mind pump, this is what you're going to get. You're going to get two free filet mignon steaks. Free bacon and twenty dollars off your first order. That's Mignon. A, that's a fat hookup. I said that good, didn't I? Yeah, I like it. Then I mentioned the crypto exchange CEO who died and lost the password. Now like a hundred and ninety <laughs> million dollars is trapped in there. Oh people, no. People aren't getting their money back. <laughs> I lost the keys. Then we talked about fiat currencies. What does that mean? We get a little conspiracy theorist in this uh, in that part of this episode. Mm-hmm. And then Adam suge- based in reality. Adam suggested that uh, in the future people will be using chocolate covered skinny dip almonds <laughs> as currency. Awesome transition now, by the way. Now the reality is like uh, theory. they are delicious almonds with amazing macro profiles. Uh, we are sponsored by Skinny Dipped. So if you go to skinnydipped.com forward slash mind pump and enter the code mind pump, you will get 20% off. Then we talk about how Burning Man is coming out against influencers. Uh oh, it's getting too big and popular. What do you do now? Yeah. And then uh, Justin brings up how Spotify has acquired Gimlet Media. And we talked about the future of podcasts. Podcasts so hot right now, Sal. Then we get into the fitness questions. The first question was how important is knowing and improving your one rep max? This is the amount of weight you can lift. For one rep, the most weight you can lift for one rep, should you even train for that? Should you test for that if you're just the average person? Is there any validity into doing that? Find out in that part of this episode. Next question, uh, this person struggles with taking days off from the gym. Uh, They love the gym. They love working out. We tell people you got to take off time sometimes. You let your body recover. They think that sucks. What should they do instead? Yeah, you can't wear a shirt with no sleeves at work. That's it. (laughs) Next Next question, uh, do we think that doctors' offices will ever include personal trainers, and do we ever think personal training is going to be covered by insurance? And, of course, we get into the discussion of whether or not personal training should be covered by insurance. And the final question, we all get into the most difficult setbacks we've ever had in our personal fitness journeys. Uh, That part gets real touching and emotional. Sal's tummy, me getting fat. And Adam's hormones. That's it's a good, it's a good it one. up right there. You got it right there. Uh, also, I want to let everybody know that Maps Performance is fifty percent off this month and this month only. Now, Maps Performance was designed with the ancient athlete in mind. That's the avatar that we had when we created the, created this program. Now, what's an ancient athlete? That's not an old athlete. What I mean by ancient <laughs> athlete is a sculpture, a Greek sculpture, a Greek god. Uh, when they did those sculptures, they were picturing their best performing warriors or their best performing Olympians. And what you have is a balanced body with definition and muscularity everywhere. Not One body part is not overpowering another body part. MAPS performance was designed to create that look, but more importantly, create that type of movement. You get full spectrum athletic performance with MAPS performance. You get strength, agility, power, and stamina in that program. Again, it's 50% off. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code GREEN50, G-R-E-E-N-5-0, no space for that discount. And on that site, you can get information about our other MAPS programs. We have quite a few on there. Go check them out. T-shirt time! And it's T-shirt time. Oh, shit. It's my favorite time of the week. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we've got... It wouldn't be T-shirt time otherwise. (laughs) 20 reviews total between iTunes and Facebook, so a little light this week. Mm. The winners for iTunes are Pamsky's P, J. Dudley, Mm. 18. Both of you are winners. For Facebook, we got Lori Brower, Trevis Andrews, Ivan... Hey, we're related. Cabrera. 
all of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, include your Instagram handle, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. So uh, Valentine's Day is coming up. I know. What are you guys doing? You guys Does it make you nervous? Valentine's? It always makes me a little nervous. Like, it, I'm forgetting something. What's the history of Valentine's Day? Is it really- It's a Hallmark holiday. That's what I was going to say. Is it really that, or yeah. is there like a history that- No, it's made up. Is it? I thought there's like a Saint Valentine. Isn't there like a? Isn't yeah, there like a Christian or Catholic? There is, isn't there? I, always, I literally know none of the history. Behind wasn't that. he a saint that blessed chocolate rabbits and gave it to children? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm just I kidding. thought he was like a little cupid <laughs> that <laughs> just shot him with things. Chocolate, yeah. chocolate hearts. Yeah. Yeah, now you get, okay, here it is. See, knew it. I knew it. One legend contends that Valentine was a priest who served during the third century in Rome when Emperor Claudius II decided that single men made better soldiers and those with wives and families. He outlawed married, uh, marriage for young men. When Valentine's actions were discovered, Claudius ordered that he be put to death. So I guess Valentine was like, wow. hey, young dudes. He's like, we need love. Yeah, you need to get married. Don't love listen to- Love is, will conquer all. That's crazy. So he actually, yeah. this guy actually was like, no, don't get married when you're young because I want you to fight harder and not now try I'm, to survive. I'm curious to hear from you guys mm. with your girls because some some girls are different. Like some girls uh, are, are bigger on birthday- Bigger on Christmas, bigger on Valentine's Day. Do do your guys' girls lean towards one holiday more as like more important? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's not as as much weight on Valentine's. She kind of shares that same sentiment that it's like, um, you know, it's a bit of a uh, uh, an artificial sort of made up uh, holiday to where like everybody has to like make reservations and do like go over and, and above and and really like sort of wow their their girl with stuff. So she's pretty low key about, it, thank God. But uh, I still make an effort. So I'm, I'm like going to be cooking for her and just do like usually it's just flowers and then cooking for her. That's like my go to. I re- what do you cook? So I just do st- I I stay in my lane, dude. And I do I'll grill and I'll do steaks and I'll do uh, uh, veggies and potatoes. So it's like kind of like <laughs> <laughs> something I'm comfortable doing, but I do it really well, you know. So yeah, and I mean I got a stock full of meat in the freezer. And oh, you got your butcher box. I got my butcher box. I'm, you, I'm <laughs> cheating. I already have it there, and it's accessible. So I got two, you know, two steaks, and and then um, actually we have this. Uh, is it the wild Alaskan salmon? Oh, did that you they see? Offer now? Yeah, no. Did you see that? It's like a. I don't. Is that an a la carte or is it like a bonus? Like when you get the box, you can get that in addition. I to think it. it's a you, bonus meat. You, bonus meat. I, <laughs> you have to select to, to yeah to, Go, to get it. If you Google bonus meat, you'll see what I'm. No, saying. it's it's a it's a monthly <laughs> special that they have going on right now that you can. Add to your normal that you can your normal order, and it's called Surf and Turf, and you get two pounds of wild Alaskan salmon plus two six ounce filet mignons for thirty nine bucks. Well, oh, that's, wow, a, that's cheap. damn! I wish I'd known that. I yeah. bought it ahead of time just by itself. So yeah, that's, that's rad. Yeah, that's the a filet mignons. The yeah. mignons. <laughs> yeah, Valentine's Day was a bigger deal when I was a kid. Like when I was a kid, there was so much pressure. That you have to make a big deal about Valentine's uh, Day. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, but dude, I mean, how excited did you get when like the hot chick gave you like a really personalized one? Did you get that? Oh yeah. You didn't get the you didn't get the generic Will yeah. you be mine? But then you found out your friend got the same thing. Yeah. And you're like, so oh, have you ever bitch. seen the old uh I guarantee you guys have these, I'm sure. Did you guys get the little basketball ones like Michael Jordan? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, it's funny. like Snoopy. I jump for you or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Taylor, generic. actually, I'm I'm curious because I know Taylor. You know Taylor. He loves to dress us up and shoot us. Now that's like his new thing. Yeah. So he he wanted we're, to we're like his little dolls. I actually think he's gonna do photos like that. He that the inspiration of the last shoot that we did was exactly that. He's like, dude, do you remember these cards? I'm like, of course I remember. Oh these. yeah. <laughs> you know, and the will be. So you guys have a. Yeah. Thinking back to all the Valentine's days that you've had, especially you, Justin, have been married forever. Oh wow, yeah. Best ones, worst ones. Like you have, you have you hit a home run before where it was like, oh, that was epic, and then times that were like, for mm. for me, it's always the best ones are always just like sex. Like if I come home and that's what's gonna happen, you know what I'm saying? Of course. I'm like yeah. <laughs> other than that, like it's you know it's all. I mean, I, I appreciate all the other stuff too. Yeah, but uh, you know, there's some that, of them where it's that's like, for you selfishly. I'm talking about you. What have you done for your girl? Oh, Have you ever yes. gone all out, or I'm you also, never? All, be- yeah, like, that was same. the best one. Yeah, yeah, same. Yeah, give him a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know what it is? It's 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 funny because uh, it's one of those holidays where because it's expected, I almost feel like it's not as special. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, nice, you got me stuff on a day isn't you're supposed ev- to. Isn't every holiday that yeah. way, though? Kind of. Yeah, yeah. but you yeah. know what? There's a little bit of, 
urgency. So it's like the, you know, just to like try, like, I don't know, like wearing things or like lingerie, those types of things. Like it comes back into the thought process of like, oh yeah, maybe I should like, you know, try a little harder this day. I'm like, what yeah, you, thanks. What St. You, Valentine. What do you, what do you wear? Do you put anything I, else? Actually, I have <laughs> one. Holy time. underwear. I, I told you guys about the whole <laughs> cowboy thing, right? What? No. Yeah. Okay. So no, we don't know she went to uh, Texas to, um, uh, we what, found out she has a Fort thing for Worth, cowboys. Apparently. <laughs> Oh, really? really? She found that out. Yeah, she went to a rodeo and was like, "Oh wow!" Like you know, and I'm just like, oh, what, "What? You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go get. I'm gonna go get like a hat. I'm gonna get like a vest. You know, and some boots. I'm just gonna surprise her. Yeah, I actually did that on the Valentine's Day. It, it rolled up like after that, so I did the whole thing. You actually <laughs> showed up in a in a cowboy. Well, she she had lingerie on, and so I was just like, I was like, that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna do something too." And it just blew her mind. Hold on a second. Hold no. on a second. I, I want to know the whole ensemble. Yeah, he's just kind of glazing over this right now. I, I'm trying to go fast. I want, I want the details. Vest. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah. Hat, vest. Yeah. I, I didn't have guns. I was like looking for a little like. Oh, you don't oh. need guns. You got a hat yeah, and a yeah. vest. Oh, going I got on a right gun. Now. How's yeah. the rest of this ensemble? I'm slinging, yeah. if you will. Is, or is that it? Was it just a hat and vest? <laughs> <laughs> it was just a hat. No, no, <laughs> no. little boy, like little, you know, booty shorts things, you know, like Wait, boxers. Really? Yeah. So, yeah, well, hold on. They're like the tight boxers. Bro, don't avoid this. Finish. The, the outfit here, They're please. Like bright red, you know, like tight, you know, the tight boxer, you know, the ones that like, you know, really, sm you know, smother the package. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So, and, and no spurs. No yeah. spurs. I would have. I would have rocked that if I had them. Did you have boots or no boots? No, I didn't have. So boots. you had a hat, a vest, and, and, and red shorts, and red red, sh red shorts, no no socks. What the no, like, what the hell kind of country? <laughs> Songs and Listen, stuff. Are you watching? I don't know any cowboys that dress the, like the, that. The hat like sold everything. That was all I needed. That's like, it. To be honest, I now, took yeah. Took did that she vest appreciate off quickly. it? Yeah, she was laughing at me for at least the first ten minutes, and then it was, and then it was like, okay, I, I'm into this. Like I knew, <laughs> like I knew you'd be into this. Like she tried to deny the fact that like that was a thing. So anyway, I was just, I was like yeah, on top of that before even. Uh, you know, she knew about it. That's awesome. Yeah. What about you, Adam? No, I haven't dressed up like that. I, you know, I'm trying to like rack my brain right now on what Katrina probably would like. I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm definitely a sport, so I definitely would do it. But I just don't. Th she's never expressed that. See, I've never. She's never came back and been like, "Honey, I just went here and I didn't realize I have a thing for you know whatever." <laughs> you know, she hasn't told right. me that, or else I probably would. Uh, you know, last I think last year was the year that I I. I kind of went all out for her. That was a year that I. Is that uh, when you put the rose petals leading up to the? Yeah, I, why well, I, I I did. Um, I think I, this is how bad. This is how terrible my memory is. Don't smoke weed, kids. I I think that I did seven dozen for the seven years that we've been together. So she got seven dozen <coughs> uh, balloons. Seven dozen. Wait, seven dozen balloons? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Oh, wait, how many is that? A lot. That's like almost a hundred. Balloons. So, yeah, yeah. So, so I if, remember I filled the whole ceiling. Yeah, the whole, How did you get them in the house? Just, I had to make trips to the play. It was a big ordeal to, to do it. That's what made it kind of cool, right? So I did, you know, uh, seven seven dozen roses, seven dozen balloons uh, in the in the room that she came home to. And I don't think I got her a gift. I mean, fuck, that was a big enough gift as it was for all that shit. She's all she walks in. Where's my present? Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was probably the most like, like where e do we have extravagant like thing for Valentine's Day that I did. I typically am with you guys. I don't I don't like Valentine's Day that much. I just I feel like it's a sexist holiday. What? Uh, yeah, totally. Why is it sexist? Cuz it's totally geared towards women. It's oh, like, like, like guys got to do all the all Well, the yeah. I mean, every other holiday like Christmas is even Steven here. Christmas, you give me gifts, I get you gifts. Well, it's a it's, fair it's thing. The, your birthday is your birthday. Gift. My birthday is my birthday. Yeah. Dad, Mother's Day, Father's it's Day. Because women, Valentine's Day for women. It's because well. uh, women like to be wooed. You know what I mean? So I'm that's not, kind listen, of our job. All I'm, I'm saying my reasons why I'm not a big fan of the holiday. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to sell me on, on why it's okay. I'm not. I don't not celebrate. It. Like, it's not fair. It's a gift you a new maneuver. But is it? Yeah, I mean, did she bed. give you, you seven I mean? dozen balloons? Of all, no, exactly. Oh my gosh! So, of all the holidays, How dare it. which one would you say is the most sexist? That's mm. probably it, uh, right? Mother's Day, Easter, Mother's Day. No, because no. you have a Father's Day. Yeah, but nobody cares about Father's Day. But it doesn't matter. It exists though for that yeah, reason to, yeah. to counter that, right? Yeah. Valentine's Day. We don't have like a day like Valentine's Day that's. Kind of geared towards men. They call it Manentine's Day. Manentine. <laughs> yeah. So it's called yeah. the Super Bowl. What are you talking about? But I think I think it's a That's good true. time uh, I, for tips for guys out there, right? So I think um, 
the 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 move is that everybody in the office, if your if your girl works in office or or, or uh, works with other people, knows it's Valentine's Day, oh, yeah. and I think it's important for men to recognize that. Mm-hmm. And I don't care if you send a card, you send one damn rose, something. You do something so she's not the only chick who didn't get shit in the office. Yeah, like that's they, you don't need to be you don't need to be the guy who gets seven dozen roses and go over the top or do something ridiculous. But you don't want to leave your girl hanging at work with all her coworkers, and she's the only one who doesn't get anything. So she, yeah, sure. you need to make sure you come through at, at at the bare minimum with that. That's what I think for for the sake of her not having to explain herself. I like, wonder what oh. the amount the the money spent on Valentine's Day for. That'd be good to look up, right? It'd be interesting to see how much money is spent on cards and balloons and you know that kind of stuff mm. probably yeah. a lot my kids i mean a lot of pollution I, I took my kids to the store because they had to go buy little valentine they still do that with the kids where they give out oh, cards to every, every schoolmate i i was going through and like writing them all for my youngest because now he's has to do it for his class and uh and so he signs his name though he can write his name and so i'm like i was thinking i was like maybe he can do all of them himself now I had to do like all of them because that would just take in like forever and ever. A, yeah, eighteen billion dollars. Wow, Whoa. that's an average of one hundred thirty-six dollars per person. That means if you spend under that, you're kind of a puke. No, you know what that means? That what? means there's some people like you who spent <laughs> fifteen hundred dollars on the balloons fuck and guys roses. Like you. Yeah, <laughs> you're like shit. I thought my eighty dollar yeah. gift was cool. And then, and then there's some yeah. guy that bought a five dollar card. Right. You know, oh, this is funny. She like a- this card. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of cool. I love you. Here you go. You know. Anyway, it's speaking all- of uh, uh, speaking of butcher box, uh, you brought you reminded me. So you know what Jessica's been doing that um, I find absolutely brilliant. She'll take because I've been trying to get my kids to eat organ meats. Do you know how impossible it is to get kids to eat organ meats? Well, yeah. You don't try Have you ever tried to feed a kid liver? Did you try and hide it in the cotton candy like the dinner we had? Yeah, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> oh I thought God. that was that oh wasn't that, that smart. Was a sneaky that, trick. That yeah. was way smart, bro. Jimmy, I ate it, but you know it's in there. You bite like oh, oh I didn't know yeah. it was in there until you guys said something. What do you mean? Yeah, when we they got it, it I didn't know. Gras. You I didn't was, taste it in the middle? Well, no, once I did, once yeah. I bit it. Yeah. But up until that point, I thought I got a little co- cotton candy on a stick. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But when <laughs> I, yeah, it's a surprise. Yeah, you don't yeah. tell your kids, you just bite it. No, but here's the surprise. Like we one, don't. One, to who? That's, that's, oh, my God. Yeah, that's this? more like a trick. Like your kid would bite into it and be like, what the? And they'd never trust you again. <laughs> yeah. No, what she does is we buy uh, liver and we have the butcher ground it up. And then we freeze it, and then when we want some, we and we freeze it. We freeze it into small servings, oh, like that's little tiny, really smart. And little add it, add it to your normal. Uh, dish. That's it. Small servings, like an mix ounce. Mix it in as you cook the meat. Wow, yeah. that's a really yeah, that's good, a good idea. idea. Like yeah. an ounce, and you mix it in, let's say six ounces. Or are you eight getting the liver from Butcher Box? Sure. No. no. Oh, okay, so no, you, I'll, I'll you buy it somewhere the else. Meat in with yeah, it, I don't yeah. think they don't sell that, but but I do get the ground uh, beef from yeah. uh, Butcher Box, and so what we'll do is we'll mix like an ounce of it in like. A pound or whatever. What a good and, idea! And it's cho- it's all chopped, so you can't you can't taste it. And so now my kids are getting an adequate amount of these uh, organ meats. And organ organ meats are very 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 nutrient high. Dense. Oh, my, they're so nutrient dense that you can overdo it. Mm. Like if you eat liver all the time, you can actually eat too much of of the nutrients that are found in them. Wow! And you know, modern hunter gatherers when they kill an animal. The, the parts of the animal that are prized the most, the, the one organs. that they'll all, the organs. Most, yeah. mm-hmm. In fact, if you- You get like the heart is like the ultimate, right? Like the heart, the liver, the spleen. <laughs> yeah. um, those are the those are the ones that like the, like if you're the hunter that killed the animal, for example. Which is obvious. They'll give that to you because you're the one that did Well, it. it's yeah. obvious because back then when things were scarce, right? You would want the thing that was the most valuable nutrient The funny thing is they didn't know that. Yeah, just intuitive. I think, I think when you're eating a natural diet- and you go through periods of not having food, and you're not surrounded by processed, palatable food that is, you know, I got Fruit Loops over here, and I got pancakes over here, and whatever. That you start to enjoy and crave mm-hmm. these foods because your body wants the nutrients. Well, yeah, and it makes mm-hmm. the most sense that those were probably the most satisfying. If you're in a state of quote unquote starving more often than you are full and satiated, which is what we live in today, mm-hmm. it would make the most sense that the the foods that are are the most nutrient dense that fulfill those needs are the ones you actually truly crave. Well, like fat. Isn't like, that crazy how much we've changed that? Yeah, yeah. and like fat. Like, think about it. In, in an, an animal, you think that the, you think hunters are like carving off the fatty pieces? No, they're freaking, no. they're fighting over the fatty pieces. And they're cooking with it. Yeah, because it's it. it's so high in, 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 in calories, which they need. They need the fat and they need the nutrients. And then speaking of, uh, uh, of the nutrients you find in livers, chicken livers are very high in cholesterol. 
And, uh, you know, I've told you guys this before. I'll go through periods of training well where I will bump my dietary <laughs> cholesterol intake up. So I'll do this for anywhere between two to six weeks at a time, and I get a strength bump every every single time. And mm-hmm. chicken liver is a great way to do that. Of course, egg yolks is the other way uh, that people like to do it. Mm-hmm. But it's it's definitely a strength booster, and I I would go as far as to say it's the it's the non talked about anabolic that um you know I I think we're gonna see in the next few years uh, people come out and start to talk about it a little more. It's an old school thing. Old yeah, school bodybuilders yeah. do it all the time. So anyway, did you guys see that article? I think it was uh, Jackie that sent it to us about that crypto exchange. Did you guys see that? Oh, uh, the Owen, yes. Owen like a hundred and oh well, ninety two bajillion so dollars what, or whatever. So how, yeah, he died. Okay, Whoa. so he, he d- died, but like, and he had the only password. <laughs> yeah, That's, isn't like, that what, crazy? What the fucked up? That's, so if you think about this, so so how cri- do people get their money? So cri- they this don't. Is, this is what's hilarious about this. It's so oh, bad to laugh about someone dying, oh my but God. The, the, what's hilarious about it is like, and. You know what made crypto so amazing is it, you know how secretive it is and how much how safe it is, and it's so safe that one person could have the the key to yeah. open all of it, and no one had, no one thought far enough or this hadn't happened yet. Like, hey, what happens when the person who's the oh gatekeeper? My God. I just imagine the, one guy just like, okay, what was his dog's name? You know, oh, and that's like, they've been trying to hack it. They're trying to hack it. They're trying to hack it. Yeah. Hack it and there's it's like the most encrypted code ever. Of so, course it is. So yeah. it's so it's a it was a Canadian crypto exchange called uh, Quadriga CX, and it cannot repay most of its one hundred. And ninety million dollars in client holdings. Wow. The, f- the founder Gerald Cotton died uh, unexpectedly. He was thirty years old, and they have put uh, it. So it has. So that's just that one crypto coin, yeah, like whatever storage. service. Yeah, yeah it's the, like a what do they call it? Cold storage or whatever. Yeah. And they they they've had experts try and crack it or whatever. Yeah. Nothing. Wow. Yeah. Oh so my you're God. so you're fucked because you should be aware. Yeah, like buying into all these different no, that's, versions. That's, right. That's crazy to think yeah, that's, that. That's Isn't that? Yeah. I mean, I think I, I'm in like five or six, and so you know, I, I, thank God I don't. I'm not heavily vested. Boy, and again, when I told people way back when I was doing, I looked at it like gambling money well, for me. Maybe, the same money that I would normally gamble in a month or whatever like that, I was throwing it towards crypto. Maybe it'll be more valuable. You know, the scarcity. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's no more going to be or it's produced. it's like a buried treasure. You yeah, know it's, a buried, it's, it's a hidden part, treasure. It's like Mayan treasure, you know. And part of me wonders if there's like something else going on. Like if there's some conspiracy going on. You know what I'm saying? Like someone uh, killed him? Yeah, because you, he owned the he only- faked his death. First of all, he owned the only password, which is kind of strange. You would think they would have some kind of safeguards yeah. with that much money. You know, it sounds like a very- Unless he's like the worst company- CEO of all time, you would think there would be some safeguards. It's interesting to think about though, because I I know the allure for crypto was that you could like really narrow it down to only like having one person sort of like having the influence over that whole uh, you know entity versus that where it gets away from you is when you have all these vested <laughs> interests you know behind it and then uh, well no actually it's the opposite it was that crypto was decentralized and that it was not um, controlled by a central bank. The problem is, is that this guy's not creating the, the currency. He just has an exchange that stores it. So, like, if you get Bitcoin, you need to be able to store it somewhere, like a, In a Bitcoin wallet, wallet yeah, or whatever. Right. Wallet. So it'd be like it, Coinbase. It, it would be okay. So it's the equivalent of you having a bunch of gold bars uh-huh. and you giving them to a secure vault, a bank. And then, and then they, they forget the code. And then they lose oh, the code. Oh, and then I you're see. coming to your bank and you're like, yeah. hey, I'd like to get my money out that I literally deposited like six weeks ago. And they're like, we can't get in there. You know uh, what? Fucking, you know, Steve is the only one that <laughs> fucking Steve fucking had the keys. Fucking Steve got hit by a bus oh, on the way man. to work yesterday. And he's the only one with the keys. Oh, no, he's the only yeah. one with the code. Except oh, it's not crazy. even a physical place that you can, you know what I mean? You can do anything <laughs> about So the actual creators of the, uh, they don't know the okay. blockchain, they don't know still. No. Okay. That's what, okay. No, uh, nobody that makes sense the way you explain. No, it. nobody knows how they created. Uh, you know who created these block, these this, this technology or these currencies. Although so, there's a lot of conspiracy theories where people think, like the CIA created it and pretended like it's a decentralized thing so that they could watch black uh, market yeah. drug deals and, and shit like that. You know. So. Oh really? Yeah. There's a yeah, whole bunch it, of conspiracy because I mean, yeah. it is kind of weird. If you don't know. Yeah. The, any possibility could yeah. be the answer, right? Well, well, weren't they able to narrow it down to like 
you know, the top 20 to 50 like people Elon Musk could could have been yeah. responsible for, like, I but think... still, th- though, there's no... Yeah, I know. Yeah, they don't know. But I thought they were, like, the, like the, the technology that's gone yeah. into crypto, I think, is, like, mm-hmm. so high level that mm-hmm. there's only so many people that even have the, the, the intelligence yeah. to create it, and I thought well, they narrowed it dude, down. Dude, whoever controls the money, man, controls everything. <laughs> I, 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 it's, yeah. uh, it's almost like we worry so much about government policies and stuff, but you need to worry more about monetary policy and who controls that, because that's... Fucking everything. Oh, yeah. Have you, you know? have you read Ron Paul's Fed Up before? Oh, that's a good book. Mm-hmm. That's a really good. That's yeah. a, that's or what about the creature oh, the from Jekyll Island? Dollar and all that stuff. Like yeah. just getting no, knowledge about that. Was the crazy. creature from Jekyll Island is really good. Oh, uh, that's the one that I think Mike was posting the other yeah. day. Matthews was yeah, Matthews. Yeah. So it talks all about the creation of the Federal Reserve, and at the time you had mm. the biggest uh, tycoons of business, um, and these mass and these extremely wealthy bankers all secretly meeting on Jekyll Island. Oh, okay. See, so bank- with with fake names and stuff to come up with this legislation to create a Federal Reserve Bank, which is essentially it's a private bank that is the only bank that is allowed to create currency. And the government- It's not federal, and the, but I like how they use that name. No, I know. It's like Federal Express. It's not yeah. really a federal entity. And the money itself is debt. So so this fed, this bank loans the money to the U.S. to use. It doesn't even give it to us. So we every dollar you get is debt towards yeah. this bank. Yeah, yeah. Right. So anyway, when you read this book, it's really it's fresh, so bankruptcy, crazy. Bankruptcy of our nation gets into that too. Though. So that's another good read. What, what's, I remember we had him on yeah, the show. Yeah, we had him on. Yeah, he, they, they touch on that. It's called, what would you say it was called? Uh, the Creature from Jekyll Island. That's, that's I think it. you might want to pull that up, Doug, just to double check. But I'm pretty sure... That is correct. Thank you, Doug. It is the one that Mike I saw Mike post yeah, about dude. like a while back. Yeah, when you read this kind of shit, you're like, "Whoa, this I is because money." You know, I know there's a lot of ne- evil and negative connotations attached to money, but money was one of the greatest breakthroughs uh, of mankind because it allowed people to trade with each other, even though they did not have things that they necessarily wanted to trade with each other. So, yeah, you know, if you had chickens and I had, you know, spears. And I wanted chickens, but you didn't want to have spears. I couldn't trade with you. I had nothing to give you. But now that we have money that represents value, Mm -hmm. I can trade with anybody. And it just exploded. Plus, you didn't have to lug heavy shit around with you everywhere and have the danger of getting robbed all the time. Yeah, that 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 was like a whole other thing. Yeah, well, it all started with the the goldsmiths, right? That used to write the receipts, right? You go to a goldsmith, you drop off your you know hundred thousand dollars worth of gold, and he would write you a little receipt, and then you could walk around and you trade all these receipts. But hasn't isn't it true that all fiat money has eventually fails in history? Yeah, that's mm. fucking scary. Yeah, fiat currencies are currencies not backed by a solid uh, commodity like gold, right. which or we're silver. not. Which we're not. A lot we of people be. think. A lot of people think we are. We used to yeah. be. People. A lot of people don't we understand be, that yeah. we are no longer backed by gold. No, no. So. It's just it's just paper. Yeah. It's backed by the U.S. Army. Yeah. You know what I mean by the military, um, uh, and and tied to you know oil sale, sales sales uh, they call it the petrodollar, but it used to be gold. You used to be able to take a dollar, go to the bank, and trade it for gold, mm-hmm. and they would actually give you gold. And little by little, they they took that away until eventually they cut it off completely, and it became illegal to have gold. You had to turn your gold in to the Federal Reserve. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Dude, there was, Doug could probably pull up these take my gold. announcements that said it, it was illegal. You had to turn it in. Um, and they that was it. The more No more gold line or gold window at the do- at the bank. Your, do- your money now is total fiat. And since then, the dollar has lost something like 90% of its value. That's mm-hmm. why that's where, that's where the, you know, a lot of the inflation comes from because in the past, in order to print dollars... You needed to it had to equal the amount of gold that we had, so mm-hmm. you couldn't just print money. Now the Federal Reserve can print money whenever they want, yeah. technically. So, what do you think the future is? I mean, do you think who it's knows in, what's in circulation? Do you think it's inevitable that we the, the dollar will eventually, at one point, maybe even in our, our lifetime, be worth absolutely nothing? I think at some point, I think we're uh, tra- I think we're gonna trade chocolate almonds. <laughs> yeah. Those seem very valuable to me. <laughs> they, they are. They are. Speaking of chocolate, <laughs> I, th- I think Skitty dips on this. Dip. <laughs> wow, dude, they're everywhere. They are. I can. They're in them. every damn store. No, I'm so glad too that they're- we need to make sure we tell them that because we send people to the to the page. <sighs> yeah, but people don't. They buy. I know. Them I feel store. guilty. I got them at CVS the other day with Courtney. Or oh, they're like, at oh, CVS they're too. Yeah, dude. So they're at CVS. Fries. Fries, CBS, CBS. Target, Target, Ralph's, Fred Meyer's. Uh, where else? And then a bunch of obscure places. I've yeah, no, I've of. seen them in random like college campuses. I've had people message me and go, "Oh, mind pump, skinny dipped," and they post, which is great. Like, I, by the way, 
I do appreciate. Uh, What's the, King? Yeah, tag us. No, no, this is very solid. I want to point this out to our audience and I, I thank those that are already doing it, and then encourage those that don't. Uh, Skinny Dip is a is a great company that we work with, and you know most companies that we do sponsorships with, they obviously measure the results, and that's how they decide they're going to continue on with us. Some of the companies recognize that they're not just. Uh, direct to consumer and that they are in big stores like Target. And obviously a lot of you that listen probably shop at Target and it's more convenient for you just to grab a bag while you're there and put it on there. And now Mind Pump doesn't get any credit for that. But what they do see is they do see everybody when they post and they tag. And so because of that, you guys have been, we've been able to sustain that relationship with Skinny Dip, then we're with them mm. for uh, at least till the end of uh, this year. Well, too. if you want twenty percent off, though, if you go through our link, right, you get you a, bit, get 20% yeah. you get a little bit better deal. But I think even at like Target and some of those they places, put they put them on sale, and like I mean, it is a better deal to go through. But let's be honest, dude. I, I I'm some people are like this. So I, I know there are some people that hey, if you save a dollar, they'll fucking go whatever, jump through whatever hoops to save a dollar. I'm not like that. I'm a convenience guy. Like yeah. if I'm in the line and even myself being I sponsored like, by, oh, cool. Yeah, if I see it's it, going I'm like, bag. oh, I just ran out of the peanut butter ones. I want some. I'm gonna grab it. So especially if you have a craving. <laughs> yeah, right. At the moment. Yeah, yeah. So anyway. But anyways, I think they're as, as valuable uh, as money, and mm-hmm. I think that that's how we're going to So trade. again, speaking as money, speaking about money, what was that Burning Man article you were trying to tell me about oh, this morning? Oh, yeah, they, yeah. They had an issue with, was it? did uh, it have to do with people buying the, stuff? The, or? The influencers? Okay, so what's happening is, and I, again, I'm proud of us for not jumping on the bandwagon. I mean, I, I really did want to go to Burning Man for a while there, mm-hmm. and- I and bec- and I don't know. This yeah, is this all the rage. I've always been this kid. I've been. I don't know about you guys, but I've been this kid since I was younger. Yeah. If everybody is doing it, I'm, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. I've never done what's cool. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, part I of do part, my own. Cool, well, being, my own version. Part of, cool. of being cool too, I think, is blazing your own trail. Yeah. And, and 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 being unique and being yourself. And you know, I've just never been a follow the crowd guy. And and now Burning Man has become so popular. You've got fucking Paris Hilton going. You've got all these people, all these influencers on social media going there. And the whole point of Burning Man, or from what I know, I don't know very much because I haven't been there, and I know Doug has. But the idea is Twice. to is to disconnect from you know technology and the world, and it's supposed to be about trading and interacting with people. And it's starting to turn into this social media phenomenon, mm-hmm. and people are posing and taking they professional just wear glitter and, Bro, and, and wings, this, and then they take pictures. This is the problem with movements like that, where they're like anti media, anti capitalism. What do you do when it gets big? Yeah. Now what? Now you've become your own enemy, and I think that's what they're struggling with, right? No, yeah. it's a, it, and you know I was reading some of it to you out loud as I was kind of chuckling over it, and you were laughing back, just like, "What do you expect?" You know, it's so true. Like, what do you, what did you expect? I mean, it's so. It, what is it? You said something like the like influ. They don't want influencers to so, get like to get because you're supposed to trade there, right? Right. So they don't. What they don't want is an influencer to be like, hey, if you give me, I don't know, five hits of acid or whatever they give out at Burning Man, I'll take a picture in front of this and hashtag it. Right. And they're saying uh, we don't like that. Yeah, because you got these big influencers. I know that uh, Amanda, Amanda Bucci on. went there this last year, and she's got a huge following. She's and she took. I mean, I, she took a ton of. And they're great photos. They're dope. They're dope photos. I like them for sure. Right. So, but I Double someone tap. like someone like that Sound going creepy. going there yeah. and using her social power to get to leverage to get things. Uh, at at Burning Man is something that they're not a, a fan of. Plus, people are doing things too, like the imagery looks cool, and then they're right. using they're using it to plug their supplements or plug whatever they, it is they're they trying to sell. Com- see, this is people completely <clears throat> misunderstand the whole idea of voluntary trade. You know, they want it to be this free voluntary place where people trade. They don't use money. Fine, you want to get rid of money because you think that's so. You know, wouldn't whatever. that be okay? That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, they're a- doing it voluntarily. What's the problem? Yeah, no, cares? they want to be controlling. They want to control it and make it look like it's this image of what it used to be. Sorry, it's never going to be that anymore. No. It's too big it's now. It's a different world now. Yeah, there's going to be another Burning Man that's going to start somewhere else. We already have luxurious RVs coming in with, you know, people want to like be- Oh, that's the other thing they were saying. They were pointing out too, like uh, p- people were are starting to only allow like the hot chicks- to, to barter with and stuff. So uh, instead of like bartering with anyone and everyone and this great networking thing, now it's becoming this like social popularity contest. And so it's called natural like a human hierarchy. Nature. Natural just, selection just happened yeah. all of a sudden. Yeah. I know that's. I, I mean, I'm I'm just repeating what I read. 
uh, I definitely don't necessarily agree with it. I mean, yeah. I think that that this is what happens. Yeah. Mm. This is what happens when something gets massive like that. It, you can no longer control it. And, you know, people are going to do that. It's just, it's, it's human no, nature. No, I think, the, I think the, the, the whole attitude there was voluntary exchange. And that's very voluntary. But I, yeah. I mean, they're just trying to, they're trying to control the image of it. Because I think they feel what we're talking about. They yeah. feel the fact that it's becoming this really big commercial kind of played out. You know, now it's a bunch of wealthy people going to get high and, you know, have orgies or whatever or, or be crazy. Whereas before... It was supposed to be it was very hippie people before. people going expressing their artistic expression, discovering yeah. themselves, being away from you well, know, you know it will philosophizing. You, you know it will happen, and this is what always happens, which is great. And I think this is again, this is free market. What will happen is somebody will who was a part of probably original. They'll the, create another one. Will create another one, and it'll be and they'll we'll, it'll be intimate and we'll small. Try and control and, it. And yeah, it'll get big. Yeah. And then, you know, it's, it's just, just like how these things go. It's interesting talking about growth too. Like you guys saw how podcasting just continues to blow up we saw just recently spotify and i'm not sure if we brought this up on the show yet or no, not. no we haven't okay so they they just i mean they have all this money now that they're pouring into the podcasting space and they bought up uh gimlet Brilliant. media for Brilliant. how much again i shared this on my story after it was we- like 50 was it 50 a uh, million, Doug, something something along the lines of that. Fifty million. I thought it was more than that. It's more. I think it was two hundred million dollars. Yeah, yeah. It was in the hundreds, dude. Yeah, yeah. It My was bad. a lot. It was a lot. Two hundred sh- million for Gimlet, and then I think they have another five. It's five hundred mil- million, million is what uh, I remember. appropriated yeah. for more. Yeah, really? so they're going to be acquiring more in the audio space, which is is pretty exciting. And then alongside that too, you saw so like Me Undies was is is. I mean, if if you listen to podcasts, you've heard these commercials on mm. like like all these different podcasts. They've been a huge. Uh, push in the podcast space, I guess it's really paying off for them. So, you know, companies like this coming in are seeing lots of value. I read that article. It was talking about how um, major advertisers now are really looking to podcasts. They're starting to realize that this is a great place to advertise because the conversion is so high. And the numbers they showed with MeUndies was it took them something like four years to sell a million dollars worth. And then after they started advertising on podcasts, I think they hit like seventy five million in a very short period of time. Wow. It was like a huge Yeah, that's a big, huge jump. Yeah, a huge jump. So I'm I'm excited. It's exciting, I'm man. excited and scared. Yes. And this is why I brought that up because of you know, we were just talking about Burning Man and how that's changed it. I wonder how much podcasting is gonna change. Yeah, it's going to. And uh, yeah, this is uh it reminds me too, I just had this conversation with somebody about the marijuana industry. Uh, close old client friend of mine messaged me and said that uh, her husband was looking into, or no, it was her brother, excuse me, was looking into getting into the marijuana business. I want to know if I was open to a call. And I guess I'm just, I must be shorter now with stuff like this. Cause I was just like, well, I have like this laundry list of things I send back. Like, does, does he know this? Does he know this? Does he know this? Does this, does this, does this? And like, honestly, like I don't recommend people getting into it right now. It's so uh, it's oversaturated now with everybody wanting to jump on the bandwagon with it. It's com- it's overtaxed. Uh, it's overly competitive. And the it's, big players like Marlboro and yeah, everybody and, else and, are already and making I, and moves. And I said, and it's an only a matter of time before the big hitters come in and put out 80% of the business of those that maybe have a nice little business for themselves anyway. So everybody who I think is in it right now, if you're not planning an exit plan or a sell plan, you better watch the fuck out because these guys are coming in. I feel I'm, I'm glad we're at where we're at right now with podcasting and it excites me that we, we got in as early as we did. And we, and more importantly, I, as far as all the other podcasts that we deal with, um, nobody has built an in-house uh, marketing team like we have with uh, both the Casey and Brett side and then in addition to that we have Taylor and Rachel who handle all the a- advertising that to me is going to be huge and crucial because what you're seeing already happening is the the middlemen coming in just like I remember with marijuana yep. so when the when the clubs first came out and started you had the farmers and then what ended up being a huge market was the broker in between mm-hmm. who started to make their money on where they can send it and put so there was a and that was a, a good run to make a lot of money in that position. The same thing is happening in the podcasting space. You have people even like our good friend Jordan Harbinger, which has one of the best podcasts out there. I mean, he doesn't even deal with any of his advertising because he doesn't have time. But because of that, the dude sacrifices fifty percent of his revenue streams mm-hmm. to somebody else who's who who is not probably listening to his show and is matching him up with brands 
that are like just willing to do advertising and pay the, the that, that the, was a big thing that they talked about in that MeUndies article was when you match up your brand with the right audience or podcast it's uh, a home run it's, why we, it's way why, better it's why we crush it's yeah. the reason why we do 4x to 8x the CPMs of any of our peers is because we built that in-house we found somebody like Taylor who's very, very talented with brand management, and he looks for companies that we specifically would want to fuck with. We turn down a ton of people, and with that, it's a lot of work. We've had to we we funnel a lot of our revenue streams to him to make sure that he's taking care of and he's doing a good job for us. I think that's going to pay off huge in the next two to three years, and this is the type. Well, what'll, this what, is what what'll, this is the writing on the wall. Right what'll now. happen is as more uh, advertisers come into the to the space as they are because it's growing. I think it was uh, the estimates were like uh, something like seventy four million podcast listeners in in two thousand eighteen. By twenty twenty two, they project it to be almost double. Yeah. Um, what's going to happen is you only have so many podcasts that will have a you know x amount of reach let's say 10,000 you know in, in individual unique listens per episode or something like that right there's only going to be so many of those and those are the ones that the pod, that the advertisers are going to want to go to because the space will be limited it's going to drive the cost up so as it becomes more and more of a desirable you know place to advertise and there's only so many spots that you can you can fill up because there's only so many podcasts that get you know, a particular type of reach. Right. It's just going to, it's going to end up being, and this is going to be kind of exciting. You're going to see people start to, to, you know, they're going to be like, like they're going to have to go to, um, what is it called? Where they're competing. Auctioning. Yeah. Auctioning. That's yeah. exactly where we're, what we're building towards right now. And that's something that the conversation that I'll be having this afternoon when I meet with Taylor again, and we've been talking about for a long time is we are trying to get to the place where we have enough cool brands that align really well with us that we all like and the spaces are completely filled for the entire year so then we can then go back and then auction off and be competitive with yeah. it and mm -hmm. that's going to really But there's really there's so much room though. I mean then then again when you look at it you think fine it gets up to 140 million, you know, uh you know listeners and I mean it's still there's still so much potential for growth and the big 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 media companies have yet to invest heavy money into producing like you're not seeing podcasts getting produced by well, by you know Netflix yeah. or it's gonna I could see it's Spotify happening. starting to do that That's it's, sure. it's happening it. already and, and this is that's what I mean we're, yeah. we're, 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 we're gonna get there yeah. and here's another piece of advice the new labels that I give to everybody that that reaches out to me that's starting their own podcast and you know and again I like to uh, attribute a lot of this to Doug you know this was uh, Doug's brilliance of being very stern and hard about making sure that we do uh, that we spend the money on the sound quality and the editing and making sure that it's very professional sounding because it's going to be extremely competitive because you do have companies now that are coming in and I, I'm drawing a blank on ones but I know I've already seen it because I've, I've thought about this and these companies that are coming in are hiring like comedians and hiring mm -hmm. people that have been speaking on television for and we've talked about this yep. when we get a guest on this show the people that are the, like the John Brinkus, why that episode was so good was this guy's been on television for 20 years. Not only does he have a great, compelling story, he's really smart, but then he also- He knows how to talk. He knows yeah. how to talk. And we all flow really, really well together. So this space is going to get competitive interesting. with other- Yeah, it's going to get very interesting. So if you're somebody coming in, your sound quality isn't up, up to par. You don't You haven't practiced the skill- of conversation flow, Bro, all new you're gonna get you're gonna get gobbled up. All new media, all new media. YouTube five years from now, yeah, podcasts. That I mean, too. That it's too. all gonna look so. Uh, it's gonna look like network TV, but on a new media. Hundred yeah, percent level, yeah. and it's only a matter of time. And and what's gonna start it is what you this. Is I love you went this direction on the conversation because this stuff is what intrigues me. Is 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 stuff like this is big money starting to make its way in there, then come all the advertisers. And once you start yeah. seeing millions of billions of dollars, then all of a sudden, like you said, Sal, companies like Netflix and companies like Pepsi and these will start to perk up and go like, okay, hold on. Well, yeah, we, we we're going to shift over here. That was quick. literally their tagline. Now uh, Spotify is like, we're going to be the Netflix of audio. Is that what they said? Yeah. 
Oh, which shit. Which is brilliant. And, and, it, and, and their platform is dope. They can Way easily dope. do it. Yeah. yeah. And so I think it's it's such a great move on, Listen, on their part. I'm going to put this out on the podcast because this is something I've been uh, lobbying for amongst us for over a year now. And I had, I've always had this vision for Spotify for us um, is I would love to find a, a young kid who fucking is just up and up on country music, like up and up on hip hop music, up and up on and one for each. And I would like to create a channel music wise underneath mind pump as Spotify. And all they do is they up update the, the playlist because I believe that that will become that platform is going to continue to evolve. And if it is going to become the Netflix of audio, We'll want to have established real estate there. Sure. One of the best ways I think we as a, a media company can establish real estate there is to put out incredible music and on that and be on top of it with each genre. And so I've been start in, sending your playlist. That's right. I've been yeah. in search of young young kids that already love passionate about music, and and I'm passionate about music and I kind of do my list right now. But I I'm not like a like a young kid yeah. who's like buried in it. I want that. I want a kid who just lives and breathes a genre mm -hmm. and is up on whatever's new coming out, creating that Do list. you basically right? who I was like, you know, 15, 20 right. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Me too. You know, I would have been great for this 20 years ago. I would have been ago. awesome at that. Right. Yeah. Do you guys think iTunes is going to, at some point, make a play to compete? Because I feel like they haven't updated their platform in so long for podcasts. You know, I think They're that, still the leading, by far, the leading I platform think for I, podcasts. I don't. I think that, um, I think that Apple, Amazon... Uh, Google, they just got bigger fish to fry. You know, as big as this space is and we're talking about right now, they, I mean, you're Amazon's fucking with shipping. You know what I'm saying? Like they're trying to change the mail. They're trying to change. So like, they're just not even paying attention. Yeah. I just think yeah. that it's so far down the road for them. If they are going to fuck with it, they're not yeah, worried they're about it right logistics, now. Logistics. Like Apple, I feel the same way. Apple is huge. Is, is It's become a luxury retail brand. It's not even like a, people think it's a, 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 a digital well, or Well, iTunes still sells a shit ton of music, but iTunes... I, you know, but it's an afterthought for it's them. It's still it's still the the number one platform for podcast listeners by yeah, far. It is. I right. think it's something like yeah, because it's it like ninety percent right because like it's because it opened it right because yeah. they, they started it and it's only a matter. Of, and I I believe in Spotify. They'll wait. Were, yeah, they'll, they'll wait and see. Like I, I bet you they're you know paying attention to Spotify's moves with this, and they're kind of, like they, they kind of sit back and see like how the market responds and all that. They I or, guarantee or they'll, you could see them, they'll put money one when it's necessary. They tried. They tried to. You guys don't. You, you there is a. There is a uh, a Spotify version for a Apple. Oh yeah, nobody likes it. Yeah, nobody likes it. The UI sucks compared to Spotify. Mm. Well, Spotify they, is they better. They took Beats. Yeah, they basically acquired it's, Beats just for that reason. Right. It's what it was they the streaming service. What they probably will do. They're gonna buy. Yes, that's what I would think. Amazon of. and Apple, when it, when the time comes where they want to go in there, or if that if that if that uh, sector ever becomes threatening. You know, if Apple's like losing hundreds of millions of dollars because of Spotify, then they'll take a few billion dollars and go buy mm -hmm. them. Yeah. But until then, it's just not it's not a big enough fish for them to fry. So they're over elsewhere and worried about other sectors that are bigger movers and they're bigger game changers, I think. Because but they still like, you know, they got enough money to like, oh hey, Spotify's making moves. Go make our own. That's kinda like it. And Yeah, just, they both were were courting Netflix for a while there. That was interesting. Who, Amazon and, and Apple. Oh both. yeah. They were making yeah, offers and nothing happened out of that. But and I still and I still feel like uh that's what will happen with one of those companies at one time. I think one of the big this is why the book The Four was one of my favorite reads uh last year. Uh because they kind of talk a little bit about this and just how massive those four companies are. And when you think about it, uh, digital music and sound and what, what uh, Spotify is doing is just, it's beneath them. Yeah. You know, it's just not, they're not worried about it right now, but mm. the time may come when they, those people are starting to, It'll and there'll be a parent yeah, that's, and it's, it's coming back to the, uh, the talk about marijuana. I feel like that's the same thing too. Marlboro's like slow rolling the whole thing. Let all these idiots jump in and like learn the and learn the hard way and figure things out and try and patent this and try and do that. We got enough money. We have enough land. We have enough power. We have enough advertising m muscle. We'll just wait until they don't, they don't even have to do anything. Marlboro has the yeah, grows. They everything. have the land. Yeah. They they have the processing. They're just, they're, they're, yeah. they're waiting for the laws. I, I, as soon as the laws change, boom. Yeah. And and to get the Factories and to get the analytics. Done. I really believe that the the slow process of legalizing marijuana. Part of that was so the government can see exactly how much we're actually making mm -hmm. before they start throwing out their taxation and legalize and say, oh, this is how it is. It's like, okay, let's let's slow roll this. 
let's take city by city, let's take the average dollar amount so they can get their numbers right, so they know how much they should be getting, mm. and allow all that to happen. Oh, I, I think it's more complex than that. I think you have that's uh, pretty complex. I think you have pharma companies, you have alcohol, you have uh, you know, tobacco was also com- campaigning against it, but it's inevitable. It's inevitable. Canada is now legalized. They just, I, I think it was the. Uh, God, was it the World Health Organization that just recommended that cannabis be They're trying to reschedule it again? Rescheduled. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but there was a treaty uh, years ago by several major countries, including the U.S., that they would never legalize marijuana. They all made a treaty on that. Oh wow! I didn't yeah, know that. yeah, dude, it's it's pretty funny if you read the whole story behind Man. it. It's pretty silly. But, I didn't know that. It's but it's uh, it's it's on its way. There's nothing they can do to stop it. There's absolutely nothing they can do to stop it. Nobody respects the marijuana laws that do exist in Cal- in 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 the US now and so many states have legalized it now you've got Canada legalizing it when Canada legalizes something you know they're right above us so. <laughs> the, the weed train is coming exactly right. this quaz brought to you by Organifi for those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use a coupon code MindPump for 20% off at checkout. First question is from Powers. How important is knowing and improving a one rep max for building muscle and strength? My thought is, as long as I'm adding weight to my working sets, I'm accomplishing the same thing. Am I leaving gains on the table by never attempting a one rep max? No. I, I like yeah. this question yeah. because of because I feel like, and I don't know if uh, CrossFit is to blame or that you know the PR culture. Yeah, yeah. I you guys know. I don't know about you guys, but the first half of my career. I didn't even know what PR was. Mm-hmm. I never even heard it. In fact, I remember when well, I was the, the word it's PR. It's a fairly recent, yeah, like yeah. acronym that people were. Yeah, that around. was not a when we were early trainers. No one's yo. What's your PR? No, it was what's your max. No, yeah, yeah. Or what's your bench? Or what's your bench? Yeah, yeah. Your it was and it was squat, right? And and even then, I remember being a trainer saying like, I don't know because I don't train that way. Because I told you guys, I didn't even ever drop below five. Yeah. So I actually never even. I always looked at it like there's so much more risk at me putting a load on that I may only be able to get one time that it's not going to benefit my overall gain. So fuck it. Why do it? No, you know, here's, so there is no muscle building benefit, uh, for knowing what your total absolute one rep max is. You don't need to do it. Um, but it can be fun. And now here's, here's where I think there might, there would be a benefit. It's not what the one rep max it's in knowing what your max is, Mm -hmm. uh, what your, what five rep or your is. 10 rep maxes. Yeah. And here's why. Now, I, I've talked about for a long time why training to absolute you know, failure is not really beneficial for most people most of the time. Occasionally, you can throw it in, but for most people, no need to go to failure. Just train at a high intensity, get close to it, but don't get to failure. And I've done this with myself for a very, very long time. So I went for a long time without lifting to failure at all, like mm-hmm. never. And more recently, I thought to myself, like, you know, I haven't really push the intensity that hard for a long time. I want to see what happens. And here's what I learned. What I learned was I thought that I was stopping a couple reps short of failure when in fact I had more like six or seven reps left. Like I was under the bar on a squat Mm -hmm. and I put 315 on the bar. And after, you know, five, six reps, I thought, oh shit, one more and I'm going to fail. And and I'm at seven. Then I get to eight and then I get to nine. Then I get to 10. It's like, whoa, I've got more than I thought in my gas tank. And, and what ended up happening is it helped me reset my intensity gauge. I can get it down helped with that. Me, it helped yeah. me recalculate what it what it feels like to get to failure. Yeah, I look at it as stretching out my capacity. Like So if I, if I know where my lines are, I can sort of build up underneath that like constantly. But I just, every now and then, like every so often, I would say like maybe twice a year, I would I would probably go to see like where I was at in terms of my squat, my bench, my deadlift, whatever it was. Uh, just this is a test uh, and, and see what my training has has been providing me. Yeah, because a lot of people fool themselves. You actually mm-hmm. see this with clients as a trainer all the time. Where um, and this is more common with female clients than male clients. And I think it's just they're taught not to lift heavy. Um, there's that whole myth around lifting heavy or you know weights and it makes you look bulky or whatever. And I'd give them a weight, and they would do eight reps, and it'd be like four more. I'd be like, I can't do any more. Like, and I know because I'm a trainer, I can see what their form looks like. No, you actually have, 
You actually have more than four more, but I know you could do four more for sure. And then they do it and they'd be like shocked. Or I'd add weight. And they'd be like, why am I going heavier? That's so heavy. It's because you they, you fool yourself into thinking this is about as much as I can lift with good form. Now, if you're, you can you can be on the other side, right? You can be like one of those macho guys like I was when I was a kid when I yeah. worked out yeah. where I over well, I You thought, can get addicted to it well, too. Well, yeah. yeah, and I want to be the counter to this message that you guys are sending right now because up until like after I was – and it was towards the middle way of competing. It was really when we all got together. I had never – chase PRs ever in my entire lifting career, even into my amateur and beginning of my professional career in men's physique, never chase PRs. It was when we all started hanging out and comparing deadlifting, squatting, overhead pressing numbers, did I then become like kind of fascinated with, okay, how far can I stretch myself? I've never trained myself to reach and exceed these limits. And I got a lot of benefits gains wise for sure. But I also got a lot of draw. More, I've dealt with more uh, injuries Joint and pain. achy joints yeah. in my life in those the 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 last three four years than I did in the previous twelve of lifting. Mm-hmm. When I was never even concerned with what is my max, where's my PR, and I and and what I what I attribute that to is partially bad programming on my part. So I'll own that. Like if I was. Literally following our programs to a T, which we never allow you to even stay in that range yeah, for you long. Get a little carried away. I get carried away, mm-hmm. and it's and it's hard not to. Mm-hmm. And if you're listening to this right now, and you say you're, oh, I'm so good, about it. liar. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Like once you hit that first PR, it's a good feeling. It's a oh, good yeah. feeling to see 500 pounds on a bar. I didn't even know I could lift that, and now I know that I could do. It. Oh, can I get to 550? Mm-hmm. And like, mm-hmm. and yeah, I, I kept having thoughts. Yeah, you start wanting to to stretch those limits and do that. And, you know, what came with that was a lot of aches and pains, a lot of setbacks injury-wise, and I didn't build a technically better physique. And I I was just fine competing at a very high level without ever chasing that. So if you're somebody who's a chasing aesthetics and you want to look really good, you you could train your whole life and never even find out what your, your one rep I max would, is. I would go to say, unless you're a strength athlete that actually competes um, – for how much weight you can lift, I would go as far as to say that really the only benefit that comes from maxing out is the potential mental benefit that you can get from it. Really, that's about it. I mean, if you're already the kind of person that can apply a high intensity and train yourself hard, then you're probably not going to benefit from having to max yourself out. But if you're like a lot of people who have a tough time pushing themselves, don't know what their bodies can do. You know, many times I would get clients that I would push them hard on a set, not necessarily because it was beneficial for their physical body, but because I needed them to see that they could go further than they thought they could. To that point, Mm -hmm. and this will sound sexist, but it's true that most of the people that benefited from this were my female clients. And that's just because I think- I think they're they're taught not to do that. Right. I think for so long they were taught- don't lift heavy already, so it's already rare that you get a, 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 a would get a female client that was lifting heavy weight five repetitions. She most certainly wasn't single doubles or triples. I mean that just that just seemed like oh if I'm not a power lifter I would never even consider doing that. So my and, and I think women are always they're they're always my better form right. My, my if I show a, a, a female client mechanics they tend to pick it up better and they and they're meticulous about their form. But if they lack anywhere when I'm with programming, it's the intensity intensity piece. Well, at least not with wanting the to, yeah, with, that's what I'm saying. Pushing to failure or getting close to that, and they are the ones who I find benefit the most mentally from this because they go, "Holy shit! I didn't realize that I was that strong." Yeah, it's interesting. I've thought a lot about this, especially because of the fact that it does provide that that benefit to the central nervous system that like like I can produce this much amount of force and I can max you know, effort in, in that direction. Now, it, for me, I found, I found different ways to sort of hack that with isometrics and, and to, to place myself in positions where I could apply maximal force in, in a certain direction, but have less of the, uh, you know, the, the risk involved uh, with lifting that type of weight. Uh, now it's a little bit more tricky because it's 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 about like really being able to to emulate that and and sort of uh, uh, mimic that sort of response, but in a stationary position. And so 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I experimented with that from a different different positioning and also with the lifts, but have found benefit to that that carried into now my lifts, and I felt that I could access a, a little bit more force production. Mm, yeah, one rep max or max training um, is all about safety. So if you are going to do it, the main focus is on being safe. So make sure you have a spotter or you set up safeties so that if you fail, you can fail and you're not going to hurt yourself or kill yourself, which has actually happened uh, to some people. Uh, make sure your form is perfect. Uh, you have to have really, really good form because the first thing to break down when you're struggling is your form. And when form breaks down, that's when injuries uh, tend to happen. Make sure you have good mobility and stability and you're experienced. If you haven't been lifting weights consistently for a year, um, you have no business testing out your, your max. Definitely not. Next question is from Dean McFarlane. I struggle mentally with taking days off from the gym. I know recovery is important, but lifting heavy and bouncing around gets me fired up for the day. Any tips to optimize my recovery day? This is Sal's problem. Yeah. <laughs> no. this is, you know, I don't know if he can answer this, actually. Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and skip him. We'll yeah. go just- <laughs> no, you know what? You know, I think people forget that uh, a recovery day doesn't mean you do nothing. Right, right. You know, you can, you can still, still go to the gym. You can still go to the gym and do really light movement, get a pump. You could do trigger sessions. You could work on other body parts that maybe need a little bit more work. You could take other classes. You could stretch. You could do, do mobility work. In fact, that'll actually optimize recovery. You actually recover better. I remember yeah. learning this mm -hmm. um, a long time ago. It was uh, earth shattering for me. I used to think. I was under the belief that you lifted weights heavy. And then you go lay down. And then, yeah, you go and lay Sit on the on couch and eat uh, food because you don't want to waste calories and let, let, let my body recover and repair. Um, and that's what I thought I had to do for a long time. And then uh, I remember over one summer, um, my dad got this job. And my dad's a, a t uh, he works with uh, you know marble, granite, and stonework. And he brought me along. And there was all these floors that we had to float with cement. And what I used to do with my dad is I would – mix uh, cement, which is, you know, it's not, it's, grueling. it's not super intense. Like I'm not maxing out, but it's movement and it's tiring it's and you do it all the constant grind. And that summer I also really got into lifting weights. And I remember a lot of the muscles that are involved with mixing cement are your, your biceps, your forearms and your back. Cause you're constantly pulling the, you know, the, the, the hoe as you're mixing the cement or whatever. Um, and of course your grip as you're carrying the buckets and doing all that stuff. And I noticed that summer, the body parts that built the most were the ones that were also involved with mixing of cement. Like my forearms built more, my biceps built more, my back built more, even though they would get sore a little bit from all the mixing of cement and it wasn't able to take a day off like I normally would where I'd work out and then just completely rest. And it kind of tripped me out. And then of course, later on when I developed trigger sessions, I realized that if I was really sore for a body part, let's say I hit my legs today and then tomorrow I'm like, oh my gosh, my legs are so sore. Really light, full range of motion, Body weight squats and lunges actually give me a little bit of a pump, and the re and I'd recover faster, and I'd yeah. actually build more muscle. Oh, that blood circulation! I mean, it's just think about like like healing and mending tissue too. You need like that blood flow, and so to to be able to promote that like in a lower intensity, moderate type of uh, a situation where we can express that movement and get that blood flow to through the joints and through the, you know the muscles that mm -hmm. need repair. It's like it's a no brainer. Now the the only the only person's got to be careful with this, and we don't know who who's asking this question, is if you're a cortisol junkie, mm. because there is there is that fine line of okay so. All of my competing, uh, I almost always was in the gym seven days a week. I rarely ever took a day off. Um, but like Sal was saying, I, I modified those days. I definitely didn't have seven intense days of training. I had probably four or five days of intense training. And then the other two, two to three days is more uh, recoverative or me doing mobility work or me walking on the treadmill. So if you're somebody who's going there and you're getting after it every workout because you like the rush of cortisol That's and, the problem. and you, you got to be careful. And this is more common than not. I mean, I saw this like crazy in the um, OTF, in the Orange Theory community. Uh, I see this a lot in the CrossFit community. These type A, high stress job people that get after everything in their life, they get after their workout and they love it. You know, they, they say things like, you know, I just... I love lifting and bouncing. It gets me bouncing around and fired up. 
Now, if you attach every one of your workouts to that and what, what makes you feel that way is a good sweat and working hard, that's because you you may be addicted to the cortisol spike and that's what you're you're getting. You got to be careful if you're that person. You got to know that, you know, am I pushing my body that much where I'm I'm breaking a hard sweat seven days a week? You might be that person. That person's got to be careful. Next question is from Adam Bora. Do you think doctor's offices will ever include personal trainers as resistance training becomes more mainstream and prescribed? Do you ever think personal training will be covered by insurance? You know, it sounds like I don't think it sounds so. like a good idea. I know. Right? Yeah. Everybody's like, oh, that would be great if if physical too you much know, liability. Wait, here's why I wouldn't want it to be covered by insurance. The regulatory bodies that cover all that shit are so Stupid, Everybody's only going to go to ninety degrees again. You would have yes, you would have terrible standards. Terrible. Everybody's got to be the same. You'd have bad choice with personal trainers. I'm sure some people would benefit, but a lot of people would would not benefit. Um, really, really good trainers um, wouldn't be able to do what they do as well as they do because of insurance. So, but that being said, do I think at some point it'll be covered by insurance? I actually think at some point you'll see more resistance training in in all of medicine because. They're starting to see a return. You know, these these companies are seeing that when people lift weights, they spend less money on having to buy drugs. They spend less. It, it's it's more cost effective. It's a good investment. I think they're going to encourage more of it. I know Kaiser, you know, encourages uh, meditation. They pay, health, yeah, yeah, they pay for all this preventative stuff now because what they're finding, we're going to bankrupt ourselves yeah. mm-hmm. if we don't do the preventative stuff. Um, as far as you know, doctors, including personal trainers, I worked with a lot of doctors, and they all sent me patients all the time. Yeah. Mainly though, it's because I was their trainer, so mm-hmm. they were they witnessed firsthand what resistance training could do, um, and so they would end up sending me their patients. Yeah, I see that. I mean, I see it, like doctors really finding and gravitating towards like quality trainers that they can refer patients too. And I think like the awareness of the benefits of resistance training will uh, be more prevalent amongst, you know, the medical community uh, going forward. But I I see it more as like, you know, referral process, not like integrated within their practice just because it's such a like there's there's a lot of lines well, there. Well, have you guys ever had physical therapy that was like covered for, paid for by insurance in the hospital? Yeah, that is it's, terrible. It's oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Like I, I, I walked out on mine. Yeah, yeah, I walked yeah, out on mine. Like you only get so many sessions, and then they're like, okay, that's it. See you later. And it's very, you know, here standing generic, in the corner, generic as fuck. Do this movement. Yeah. I'm gonna be over here. Yeah. It's it's just I had a physical therapist that rented a, a space in my gym when I had my 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 personal training studio because she did not like the limitations that were placed upon her in the system. She went private. And I, and I remember asking her, I said, why, why are you going private? Why not stay? Because she had a nice you know, position in a big hospital. She's like, I can't do what I really want to do. I want to help all these people in these, all these ways that I know it'll help them, but I'm limited because I have to follow this protocol. I can only do this much. Um, and so she chose to go private. And of course, she was extremely effective. And I learned quite a lot uh, working with her, and I think that's what personal training would be if they put it in hospitals. You know, and here's where I think it'll end up happening. First is in the for the elderly. They're already starting to mm-hmm. recommend resistance training to the elderly because they're starting to see it make a huge difference. Yeah, in home in home care is exploding. They'll probably start right now. with machines and then they'll branch out. Well, I hope I hope we. I mean, I'm banking on we'll be a major conduit for this. I think that uh, you know, as as Mind Pump continues to grow, I think our relationships will start to build with hospitals. We're already we're starting to build more and more relationships with doctors. You know, once they get to know us and the information that we're providing, I could foresee them recommending first to go listen. Hey, listen to this episode or listen to these topics because we've covered so many things. We've had so many specialists that have come on the show that, have, I mean, like we just had a great interview just, just now with Gabrielle Lyon and, you know, talking about like menopause and hormone stuff. Like, you know, we have a, a good doctor that knows who we are and that we provide information like that. I would hope that they are starting to recommend, like, go listen to this episode. They talk in depth about that. We also provide great programs that should complement a lot of the information mm-hmm. that we're putting out there. So I hope that we are uh, definitely a major catalyst in that in that area. Yeah, yeah we're, resource. We're, we're about to enter into a revolution in understanding um, surrounding resistance training. I don't know what that's going to mean for insurance companies and conventional medicine. I'd like to think that conventional medicine will be a part of the revolution. Um, I'm seeing more and more studies that 
are showing the remarkable benefits of resistance training for pretty much anything, including cognitive health, uh, function, you know, diabetes, uh, you know, uh, cancer treatment, helping people with uh, as they age. Um, but uh, I think we're about to enter into revolution, uh, revolution with it because resistance training up until now has been the kind of played second fiddle to cardiovascular training in terms of exercise. Like uh, up until right about you know right about now, if if you were recommended vigorous activity, it was aerobic. It was thirty minutes of vigorous activity. Um, and resistance training was kind of like, oh, that's what you do if you go to the gym and you want to lift weights and if you want to build muscle and, you know, especially if you want to build a lot of muscle, that's what you do. But otherwise, walking provides enough resistance to build up your bones and your legs and, you know, they'd say stupid shit like that. And I think we're about to enter into a new revolution of understanding where resistance training becomes very, very, very mainstream in terms of how people understand it and its applications. Well, I've seen to um, lots of insurance companies and, you know, the, there's a lot of digital health initiatives in terms of companies trying to really provide analytics and data on each one of the patients. And, you know, they're trying to push things through past HIPAA, you know, restrictions and things like that. But I see that uh, eventually that's going to be more accessible to where uh, if you are, if you have devices that will help to kind of provide more data for, uh, you know, your physicians, your insurance companies, and you're, you're willing to, uh, you know, give that information. So I, I guarantee that there's going to be more breaks that, that, that we'll see, if, like, the healthier your markers yeah. are. The, the challenge is, you know, and always has been with resistance training, that it's complicated. Yeah. Uh, at least much more complicated than, you know, going for a 30-minute walk. And that's where I'm interested to see how, you know, people overcome that hurdle. Because if you tell the average person, hey, 30 minutes of weight training four days a week, of resistance training four days a week, is what you really need to do, yeah. people are going to be like, okay. Okay, how do I begin? Yeah, what does that look like? And then you say, oh, you know, push-ups, squats, lunges. They don't have good form. They don't have good control. No one's going to know what to do. Oh, I'm, I hurt myself. Yeah. I can't do it anymore. I don't want to hurt my back, though. I'm not supposed to lift weights because I have back problems, not realizing that if they do it right, it'll fix their back problems. So it's gonna. It's, there's a much more of an. There's a there's a steeper education curve, a learning curve yeah. that goes along with resistance training. That's, that's where I'm interested. Yeah, that's where I'm interested to see, you know, how how we tackle that. Next question is from Mind to Muscle. What was the most difficult setback in your personal fitness journey, and what did you do to overcome it and bounce back? Oh, geez, that's easy for me. This was I've talked about this many times. This this was uh, your gut, right? Yeah, right around. Um, I want to say thirty. I think I was like either 29 or 30. And remember, at this point, I had been really pushing my body f for years. I mean, from the age of 14, pretty much on, I've consistently lifted weights and eaten and supplemented in a way to try and build muscle. So it's just been a consistent uh, process. I've never taken time off, like, aside from the you know occasional injury and illness, um, but I've never taken longer than you know a week or two off. Always pushing. And at the time, you know, during that period of time, the early years, I would say, it was driven entirely by my own personal insecurities of my body. You know, I was a skinny kid growing up. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I actually thought I was skinnier than I even was. That's how bad body images can be. Because I look at pictures now, I'm like, you just look like a regular skinny 14 year old. But I thought I was, made, you know, much worse, didn't like the way I looked. And so it was because it was driven by this kind of self hate. I did a lot of things that wasn't that weren't great for my body. I, I worked out in ways that weren't good for my body. I pushed myself too far often. I took lots and lots and lots of supplements and combinations of supplements with zero regard to any negative effect on my health. I force fed myself food um, in insane ways. I mean, uh, I, I I would I put tuna fish and eggs and chicken breast in a blender and I blend it up so I could drink it. I drink, mm. you know, these 5,000 calorie shakes that I'd buy that were terrible. I'd set my alarm in the middle of the night so I could wake up and drink a shake. And I just did a lot. Of, I would walk around with protein bars and, and just insane stuff. I took designer steroids uh, that at the time were available over the counter, probably worse than actual anabolic steroids because they were you know uh, these these oral steroids the that rejected were version. discarded yeah. by pharmaceutical companies because they would it's, you know cause liver problems in, in animal studies and these are the ones that these companies would end up selling on the, on the gray market and I'd take those so I just did all this shit to my body um, and didn't really pay too many consequences and then right around twenty nine thirty um, my body rebelled 
I all of a sudden could not keep any weight on. I was I had severe gut issues, um, and it's really a, a terrible situation to be in for somebody who I mean, take your deepest insecurity. So if you're listening right now, and you're like 99% of us, you have some pretty bad you know you have some insecurities. Think of the most the most difficult insecurity you have. Now imagine if life poked you right on it, right? So like my big insecurity was not being muscular and now I'm losing weight and I can't keep it on and food doesn't stay inside my body um, and I'm depleted and nutrients depleted. I looked pale and I lost uh, close to 15 pounds um, in a very short period of time. And, and, And remember at the time I was fooling myself and thought I was this fitness and health expert. Really, I was just a, uh, I knew exercise and I was a muscle building expert, um, if you will. And so uh, here I am, I'm thinking I'm eating healthy. What am I doing? I'm eating, I'm not eating, you know, lots of uh, fat. I'm eating all these whole grains. I'm eating all these other things. And these supplements are fine, right? I'm taking all these supplements. What the hell is going on? And I couldn't figure it out. Went to the doctor. Um, they, you know, they were saying maybe it's some kind of autoimmune thing that's going on. And uh, luckily for me at the time, I worked with, um, some wellness experts in my facility. And thankfully for me, I've always been very open-minded. So although I was a, a, a meathead kind of person, I in my st- in my facility, I had acupuncturists. I had people who, who tested gut health and did hormone testing. I had a uh, massage therapist that was all into the esoteric and, and meditative type stuff. And all to me, it was kind of weird what they did, but I saw that they did with their clients. Their clients appreciated it and it was, it was effective. And I like these people and I, you know, I'm a, I'm a people person. And so it was all good. It just wasn't for me. So here I am, can't figure out the fuck's going on with me. Doctors don't know what's going on. And so I finally turned to them and I'm like, I need help. Like, I don't know what the hell's going on. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And so, uh, the person who did the gut health testing had me do some, some tests at the time, leaky gut syndrome was a bad word. If I had said leaky gut syndrome to any medical doctor, they would have told me it was hogwash. It was, you know, bullshit, you know, might as well go pray to some crystals. Like nobody, nobody thought that was a real thing. Now, of course we have a scientific term for it. Uh, so what is it? Uh, hyper uh, gut intestinal hyper, uh, permeability or something like that. So it's a real thing, but nobody believed it. And so I, she did all these testing on me and she said, okay, uh, According to your test, these are the foods you probably have intolerances to. We're going to do an, an elimination diet. We're going to cut these things out. You're going to reduce the intensity of your workouts. You're going to focus on your sleep. You're going to meditate. I incorporated high CBD cannabis at this time as well for its uh, immunomodulating effects. And But the biggest thing that I did was uh, I changed how I viewed uh, exercise, truly, for the first time in my entire life. Remember, up until this point, it was driven entirely by my insecurities. It was driven entirely by my self-hate. And uh, I had gotten to the point where I didn't even care anymore. I just wanted to be healthy. And so I started to um, just started to realize that I had a healthy body before and I was making it unhealthy. And so I started to treat my body like I cared about it. Um, and my focus was entirely on my health. And it took me about a year. I mean, it was it was to the point where Especially in those early days, I had such a terrible, insens- a terrible sensitivity to gluten that I could literally, if I ate something that had a breadcrumb on it, I remember my mom. You know, my mom makes these uh, these chicken cutlets, and she breads them. And then when I'd go to eat dinner there, she'd make mine without any breading on them. But if they were cooked in the same pan and I had like some breadcrumbs on it, I'd eat that. Jesus, and I was fucked. This was like in the first months, so I had to be like insanely strict and it took about a year and it's a weird process you know I didn't really look at myself in the mirror like I used to like I used to judge myself in the mirror and pick my body apart and oh I'm too small and my body part this and that and the other because I changed my mindset I didn't pay attention to myself that way I didn't look at myself in the same way and it's funny because about a year maybe a little over a year later I was hanging out with some friends and, uh, you know, there was a, a, we were in a pool, I went to the bathroom and I go in the bathroom and I, there was, there were two mirrors and one of the mirrors was reflecting off the other mirror. And so for a split second, I saw a reflection of myself from an angle that I'm not used to. And for a split second, I didn't recognize that it was me. And so it was a very strange phenomenon. I saw myself like someone else who sees me 
Does that, I don't know if that makes any yeah, sense. I got you excited. A so, bit. Yeah. So I, <laughs> just, yeah. So I wasn't able to, I didn't judge myself in the same way that I normally did. I, I just looked and then I said, oh shit, that's me. And then I went, whoa, I look handsome. As I look fun. really Dude, good. Look, look at those glutes. Fucking handsome No, shit. not like that. I looked at, I was like, whoa. And so then I looked in the mirror and I realized at that moment I had looked better than I had for most of my lifting career. And all I was focused on was on my health. And so although it was the biggest setback, that I'd ever uh, encountered, it actually is what turned me into who I am now. I mean, who my voice on Mind Pump would not be what it is today had I not gone through that yeah. very, very difficult uh, period. So it was a blessing. But at the time, I'll tell you, it was a fucking Oh, curse. you helped us understand, you know, the microbiome. And, like, I had no idea, like, the depth of, uh, you know, how that affected us. And, like, just bringing all these experts on, uh, to educate us on uh, that. And it's such a new science that uh, I had never even really uh, ventured into. So that was, yeah, that was really cool to to learn from you going through that process with that and then bringing that on the show. So that's crazy. I, For me, I, I think I brought an example of this up a long time ago. I mean, I just, I fluctuate a lot. Like um, uh, there was a one point after college, like I got, I turned into a fat turd and that's, <laughs> that's basically the, the, the amount of me, uh, just, just sort of like putting on, putting the brakes on because I had been training so fucking hard for decades and I was just like full throttle, like redlining, uh, every time I hit the weight room. And so for me to just take, take that time away from from the gym was just like a shell shock like my body just completely like shut down and was like trying to make sense of it all and uh, it took me a while to get pick myself kind of back together to to get motivated to even train again because all I knew was uh, that one that one mode which was just like all and so uh, that was that was quite the process for me to, to, to just reorganize my thoughts about well, I'm not competing anymore. Like, what do I do? It's like, I think a lot of athletes go through that process of like the identity of it. Like, well, I'm not an athlete anymore. Mm. So what, what am I doing in here? Like, right. what, 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 what's the motivation? What's driving me? Like, I wasn't motivated by looking at myself. I actually think that's really, really common. Super common. Yeah, I've trained a lot of ex-athletes that are, you know, in their 50s and stuff like that. Just They lost all their motivation. Everything, yeah. Yeah. Because they were training for a sport. I'm not training for a sport anymore. Why the hell am I inside this gym? And I, for a while, it was funny because I would, like, try and recreate things. Like, I would do, like, some of these weekend <laughs> warrior things where I'd play in, like, a three-on-three basketball tournament. And I would like join. I probably if if it existed back then, the Spartan races, I'd be that guy. Like I'd be like, yeah, we're doing the Spartan race. Like like every like weekend, I would be like like signing myself up to do something like that because it's like either I'm competing or I'm not, and that's like all I knew about myself in terms of like trying to challenge my body. And uh, so, thankfully, I got into uh, the, the training world and and saw opportunity there to kind of you know, figure that out as a job. And that taught me so much about just like your average person and, um, you know, just the, the daily things that they, they try and figure out and, and get stronger and, and lose weight and all these types of things. And I'm just like, okay. Then things just started to click like, well, why am I not considering eating better? Why am I not considering, uh, you know, my joint health? And, and that's, and then I started to get really into mobility and just like overall quality of movement uh, you know, bettering my nutrition, which I hated. I hated that whole process of learning uh, more about nutrition. I just, you know, as an athlete, I was just, I can, I can work my way out of uh, whatever calories I'm, I'm, you know, taking in. Which is the opposite of the saying, as it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like that, that was just the mentality, though. I'm gonna be honest. So, you know, just like getting through that whole process was. I mean, that took a couple of years to be honest. So I. That that was challenging for me, and then I, from now on, it's a totally different mentality. I uh, it's I was thinking right now. I'm, I went last on purpose because it, it's easy for me to answer the the same thing because uh, nothing I feel like come compares to what I went through not that long ago. Um, losing or coming off of testosterone, and and that was. I don't. I don't wish that upon anybody. I think that I've I've dealt with uh, all kinds of little injuries and uh, even major ones where I had surgery on uh, my ACL and MCL. 
Um, and I was totally fine with those things. I like, I set back for a couple of weeks. I was back in the gym. I was lifting even with a brace and crutches and, you know, and even though it sucked, I, I got back on the horse and never had a problem with it. And I've had shit happen in my personal life that affected the gym and work and always been able to bounce right back. I, I fell out of shape big time, uh, when I was in cannabis and then came back and documented that whole process and, all of those things to me were like nothing. It wasn't, it wasn't hard for me at all. It was literally like changing my mindset and getting after it. But when I went through the coming off testosterone, uh, that was absolutely fucking miserable. And it's the closest thing to what I have ever felt to depression. Like I don't, I don't know for certain if I was technically depressed or I, I battled with that at all going through it. But if there was anything that I've experienced in my life that I would say is like that, I would say that. And that was really t- difficult for me. Um, and what I found, and I found myself like originally like reaching for like different workouts or I was trying to motivate myself and doing, you know, listening to pump you up music or laying out my plans or doing my, you know, getting my food already, like trying to do all these things that would uh, assist my motivation in the gym and nothing was working. And until I finally just said, fuck it, I'm just going to go with it instead of trying to fight it and be so attached, uh, like Sal said, with, you know, being this muscular big guy, it's like, okay, it's inevitable. I'm off of testosterone. I have as much testosterone in my body as a you know 13, eight, 13 year old teenage girl. Uh, I'm not going to build build a bunch of muscle on me right now. So stop thinking like that and to refocus on other things that I can do. And for me, that was a lot of mental growth. So I began reading uh, a lot more more than I, I already currently was. Um, I began listening to music. I, I started to seek out things in my life I, and I had to really think back all the way to childhood of the stuff that gave me, that has given me joy, uh, through my, uh, adolescence to teenage, to a young adulthood, things that, uh, I've loved that had nothing to do with fitness, uh, or not nothing to do, but aren't really, uh, centered around the way I look, uh, and building muscle. Uh, so basketball, uh, music, snowboarding. Um, these things, uh, are, are things that have fulfilled me before in the past. And I started to implement them into my life because I couldn't control, uh, my hormones. I could, I, and I was doing all the things that I needed to do. You know, I was doing the infrared. I'm worried about my stress. I'm taking the tongue cat alley, the ashwagandha. I'm doing all the stuff that Sal's got me lined up and nothing is giving me that feeling of, you know, elevated testosterone levels like I was used to. And it was really tough. And so I had to really latch on to other things that gave me joy. Now, I also think it's one of the, the best thing that's, that's happened to me. Um, I really, I think it was really good that it happened after I came off of bodybuilding for four years because in bodybuilding, no matter how level headed I was going into it, um, you know, the whole sport is around being this big muscular guy and that ain't going to be possible when I have no testosterone or very little testosterone flowing through me. So I think being able to switch that mindset was really important. I think sometimes what happens when we, we get in these ruts is instead of kind of like going with our body and, uh, you know, my mom says this really well, you know, son, you go through seasons of your life all the time. And instead of crying that it, we're on to another season or trying to force it to be that season season to kind of go with the body and allow it and be okay with it. And so I did. I, and even, you know, today now, uh, because my, my levels aren't high again, my focus is just really different right now. I'm not, I'm not freaking out that I know I'm not hitting weights that I was hitting just two years ago. I'm not worried that I don't look uh, the way I looked just two years ago. Um, I'm, I'm celebrating the other victories, like, uh, the, the amount of books that I've put away, the amount of personal growth I've had, uh, being back, uh, into sports like basketball, which is a, a major love of mine. I snowboarded, man, I've already been on the mountain like six times this winter already. Uh, my mobility, I'm, I'm more mobile right now at 37 years old, uh, than I've been in my entire life. And so I've learned to latch on to other things that aren't directly connected to the things that used to drive me in the gym. And so if you're in a slump or you're, 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 you're having a setback, uh, evaluate your goals and the things that you're, you're focused on. And if you're in a place 
right now because of injury or hormones like uh, like I'm going through or like somebody could be going through because they're pregnant or they got some, or menopause or something like that instead of attaching yourself to the things that used to drive you before reframe your goals and give yourself other things to drive and focus on that you can control and then celebrate those victories that's what got me out of that that darkness or that side was to let go of some of those things and um, you know I'm the you know Justin and I are probably the more religious or spiritual ones at all of us. And so I, I believe that that was given to me as a gift, which is a fucking twisted way to look <laughs> at it. Right. Here's low testosterone and a, a torn Achilles, Adam always but, works that way. Right. But I, I, I believe that it, it was something that I needed in my life because it, it took away these other things that I was so mm-hmm. hyper focused on. And now I've had to look at other places. Well, Growth comes from being uncomfortable. Absolutely. Ne- the growth never happens when you're comfortable where you're at. You don't need to change. There's no reason to change. And real change is painful. And so the only, you literally have to be forced to grow because staying put is more painful than growing. Right. So think about that, right? So you're in a situation where you can't work out like you normally could. That shit's real painful. Okay, I'm forced to look at things a little bit differently now. Right, right. Yeah. So with that, look, if you go to mindpumpfree.com, you can download any one of our guides for free. Actually, you can download all of, all of them if you want. Also, you can find us all on Instagram. We have our own pages. My page is Mind Pump Sal. Justin is at Mind Pump Justin. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now, plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.